Uh, welcome to the Declutter Me podcast. Um, today I have a special guest, uh, which I'm very excited about. It's uh, my dear friend Sarah from the UK. Um, she owns a decluttering company called Free Your Space and she's based in South East London, which is always lovely. Um, and she works uh, predominantly with um, ADHD clients. So I wanted to talk to her today about that and about how she works with them because I don't have too many clients who have that and help them. I don't help them to uh, get organized. So I thought it'd be interesting to find out more information from her. Um, so Sarah, welcome to the Declutter Me podcast. Thank you very much. I'm, I'm very happy to be here. Awesome. Um, I wanted to just, yeah, ask you those questions, find out about how you started, what you do, and like some, you, you know, tips and tricks. You've sent a, um, a, a guide that we will share as well later. Um, but first, like you started in 2014. So what were you doing before then, uh, before you started this? So um, I had three children starting in 1996. I had three children in five years. And uh, before then, I was actually working as a community physiotherapist. Wow. And so, yeah, I was actually working in clients' homes, well, in patients' homes. And I was working with people with disability. So I was actually working with people with complex needs right. in their own homes. And I kind of reached the zenith of my career in terms of I'd gone as far as I wanted to go. And I knew that when I left, when I took maternity leave, that I wasn't going to be going back into physio. Right. And I wasn't sure at all what I was going to do. I had no idea. But I was like, right, I'm going to do this children thing. <laughs> and then my mind later. Yeah. So, yeah. Wow. Okay. And then, so what made you decide let's become an organizer, let's start getting into this. So yeah, that's a, a funny story really, because I saw a program that was on in the UK called Life Laundry. I don't know if you if you remember it. No. It a long time ago. Yeah. <laughs> it's about 20 years ago now. Right, and it okay. was an American woman who came and she, what they do, the, the format of the program was they'd empty a room out in the garden on a big tarpaulin and then she'd talk through the stuff with the um people on the program right and you know there were often like long conversations it wasn't just a kind of makeover thing it was it, i look back now and i think that woman was probably a professional organizer who came to the uk and saw a tv opportunity yeah at the time i watched that program and i was like oh my goodness that's like my dream job i would love to do that right and and at the time, I had no idea it was a job. I just thought this was a TV program. <laughs> so I spent years, literally years, when people said to me, what are you going to do? I'd say, oh, when, I, when the children are older, I'd love to do this, but I, you know, that would be my dream job. Yeah, yeah. So, so that was my story. And then I finally discovered that it was actually a job. Yeah. And then it took me about a year from that point to pluck up the courage to actually go for it and I think interestingly it's kind of part of my ADHD story in that um, the reason that I didn't go for it earlier despite telling all my friends that's what I wanted to do was that I had this kind of fear that I wasn't perfectly organized I right. was very aware of that that I would drop balls from time to time and so there was this one side of me one side of me, my friends would say, oh, yeah, Sarah's really organized. Another side, they'd be like, oh, she's a bit dippy. She kind of forgets things from mm. time to time. So these kind of alter egos going yeah. on. And so I had a, a story, somebody talking into my ear saying, you're not perfectly organized. So how can you charge other people for yeah. your help? So, so that was that was a bit of a... Um, self-limiting belief I would say <laughs> in terms of getting started so how did you go around that self-limiting belief and like to push yourself to get to that beyond you know to become the organizer because uh, you know there was no one that there wasn't many people in the UK who were organizers uh, you know focusing on that and that there wasn't you know you most probably didn't know anyone to talk to really about this as well right yeah, that's right. Um, I think at the time I barely knew, I don't think I knew about Apto, but I had friends, a really good bunch of friends who just sat me down one day, I can remember in the local cafe, yeah. and they said, Sarah, if you don't do this, how are you going to feel about it? And I, 
I'd been thinking about it. I'd been doing some admin work for different companies and it just didn't, I just didn't really enjoy it. I could yeah. do it and be competent at it, but I didn't enjoy it. It didn't spark joy, if you like. Yeah. <laughs> and, and so that conversation at the uh, outside that cafe just made me think, right, from the beginning of 2014, I'm going to give this my best shot and I'm going right. to do it for a year and see how it goes. And so in January, I joined Apto right. and... I haven't looked back really since that point. Came to conference in March, um, made some really good friends. That's what you were in, yeah. at that conference. I think in 2014. No, maybe 2015. I joined in 2014. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah no, time flies, doesn't it? Um, and, it really does. and so how have you found it? You know, I mean, I remember years ago, ADHD wasn't really a term. It wasn't a known thing, you know people weren't diagnosed with it when I was at school. It was, you know, it was very difficult. It's now become a known, you know, um, clinical term really, isn't it? So how did you get to people and get them to educate them to become, you know, to get your help in a way? Well, I, I think the history of ADHD in the UK is really interesting because we're way behind um, Europe and the UK are way behind the rest of the world. So in South Africa, Australia, the U S they've been diagnosing people with AD, ADHD for years. Right. Whereas for us in, in 1990, I think there were 40 people in the whole of the UK who were being treated for ADHD, right. which considering it's thought to be three to 5% of the population it's really quite shocking. Yeah. So, yeah. So um, for me, like I, uh, my ch one of my children was diagnosed with ADHD the year before I started working. So it was kind of on my agenda and mm -hmm. I recognized that I had many of the symptoms and challenges that my son had. So I kind of thought of myself as on the spectrum, but I also thought oh, I'm coping too well really to it, it was kind of like I was caught in between these two um extremes on the one extreme I wasn't perfectly organized right. on the other extreme I was pretty damn organized if you'll excuse yeah. my language <laughs> and, and so it's like I had these two personas going on and um so right from the point that I started working I told people that I was in I had an interest in ADHD that's how I framed it in the first right. year and I was lucky to, that a client with ADHD picked up on that and came to me. And we worked together a little bit that yeah. year. And I learned so much from working with her. There were a lot of, like, you know, quite challenging things about that particular episode of work. Um, but I learned a lot. She right. enjoyed working with me. Um, but actually, we decided to part ways at the end of that session, which sounds weird, but... She, I felt that she just wasn't quite ready to let right. go of stuff at that point. So I just, we just had a very honest conversation. I said, you know, come back to me in the future, mm. but I feel like this is not the right thing for you right now. She was really finding it difficult to let go of stuff. Right. Um, so, yeah. Oh, well, well, and so, you know, you know, because it, there's different spectrums, how do you deal with that different levels of having ADHD? You know, I, I've, yeah how uh, so so with adhd it's really interesting because people always assume that if you've got adhd you're really chaotic and disorganized but i actually come across quite a range of people so i would say adhd is the only thing these people have in common right um they have significant impairment in terms of their executive function so they have challenges in terms of getting stuff done right and um, one of the most important things to understand about ADHD is that actually it's a dopamine dysfunction in the brain. So um, the brain uses dopamine as a kind of reward based system. Right. And with ADHD, there's actual changes in the brain on a biochemical level, but also on a structural level that mean that that reward based system is not working so well. So essentially what happens is that you need extra dopamine or you, you haven't got enough dopamine. I haven't got enough dopamine compared to you. Right. So it takes more to kind of motivate me to get stuff done. Right. And this is particularly true if you're not interested yeah. in the stuff that you're doing. So if, if somebody with ADHD is interested, they'll operate pretty normally. So, right. um, so 
people with ADHD often do follow their passions, which is a really great strategy because the more they're doing the, the job and they're living the life that they enjoy, yeah. the better they'll function. Mm-hmm. Um, but if they're in a job or you know in a life that they're just not interested or engaged with, they're going to find it much more difficult. So, you know, these are people who, you know, at an extreme level will find it difficult to make themselves clean their teeth in the morning. Um, at another level, you know, you've got the kind of people like Richard Branson and, you know, lots of famous people, particularly in the acting industry, yeah. who are really high achieving because they've got a team of people around them who are helping them get stuff done. Yeah. They're helping them get boring stuff done, right? So <laughs> yes. My, my work with clients is all about how can we get you activated so that you're getting the stuff done that, that you're resisting. Right. Um, and that's been my own journey, really, is like, how can I persuade myself to get started on this? And, right, yeah. Um, and, and so I use the strategies that I've found helpful for myself with my clients. So how, so what kind of strategies do you use to get these kind of clients? I mean, it's hard enough with clients. I mean, when they come to us, they're all, you know, they're at that breaking point. They need help. They know they need help, but, and I'm sure I might have clients that have had ADHD and I've just not realized, but they've, you know, a lot of them say they just don't know where to start. They've been procrastinating. They don't know don't want to declutter they need help and I'll push them to do it you know to get it done and organized but what do you what I might do Uh, you know yeah so there's there's so many different elements to this and and like when I'm training other professional organizers I always say to them the most important thing is not the everyone wants the practical tips yeah but actually the most important thing for adhd is what goes on in here right and we can really help our clients you know when i'm working with clients a lot of the work i'm doing is kind of um helping them unpack some of that baggage not not as a therapist but as a sort of ally on the ground by their side right so for example with adhd there's a lot of um negative reinforcement going on so People have been told all their lives, oh, you're really scatty, you're really disorganized, you're really chaotic. Those are the voices they've heard and those are the voices that they'll hear in their own heads. So they often start off with quite a negative mindset. And so we'll work on that. We'll talk about that during sessions, just as we go. It's not, you know, we're not sitting doing therapy. Um, No, we'll chat about that stuff. And one of the things that I'm always trying to encourage my clients to do is to understand themselves and the way they tick. So yeah. sometimes people come to us wanting techniques, they want to be told. And, and I always say to them, there's not one individual strategy for ADHD that's going to work for everybody. Yeah. It's understanding how you tick and then cherry picking the right solutions for you. Right. And so we try and build on success. So you know, if, for example, they're really struggling with their time management, I'll say to them, you know, what was the last thing that you do, did that you turned up on time to? Mm-hmm. And then we'll kind of unpack that a little bit. We'll work out what the motivation was for them, oh, what they wow. could use to kind of prepare um, and make that happen again, really. Right. So you're learning from, from success all the time. So I'll say to people, you know, when, when, when was the most successful decluttering that, that you did? When, how did that work out? And they'll describe, say, oh, my mum was coming to stay, so I got a friend round, and we did loads of stuff. We did a really intensive day, and we got loads of stuff done. And then I'll use that to help me work with them. Right. Because I know then that they're very socially motivated. I'll encourage them to use body doubling. Um, you familiar with body doubling? No, well, not the term. I might, might do okay. it. <laughs> the term. Okay. So, yeah, body doubling is great. And, and we do do it. All of us do it. But right. it's the idea that when you've got somebody else in the room with you, you're m- much more likely to get stuff done. So oh, like, wow. Okay. <laughs> that person could be sitting in the room with you doing their own tax return yeah. and you'll stay on task better than you would do. You know, people with ADHD are very distractible. They'll often go down a kind of internet rabbit hole yeah. um, while they're working with you if they haven't got their notifications turned off. Yeah. And if you've got somebody else in the room working with you, it keeps you on track. It keeps you focused. So oh, wow. It's great. 
for people with ADHD. And obviously I act as a body double when I'm working with them. They yeah. they might never get their paperwork done if I wasn't sitting in the room with them. Yeah. Um, yeah. But also yeah. I encourage them to use friends and stuff in between sessions, just as a sort of technique. Because, you know, it's, to me, it's not just about me coming in and doing everything for them. I want to set them up for life, really. I want yeah. to give them some tools that they can take on with them um, beyond our sessions and use in life. So we're talking a lot about um, uh, the way you look at yourself, the way the language you use about yourself and to yourself. Right. That's yeah. one really important thing. We're talking about understanding how you tick. Um, that's another important thing. Another really helpful tool for them is to start using curiosity. Right. Um, so because there's always been this kind of history of judgment that they've applied to themselves, I would say to them, observe, but don't judge. So, yeah. you know, you look at how yesterday went and you think, oh, oh, I had a terrible day yesterday. I got up really late. I spent too much time on Facebook. I didn't do this. I was late getting my kids to school. And you, you're immediately piling the judgment on. And I would say to them, let's reframe that. So uh, yesterday, you got up later than you planned. Um, can you look into that a little bit more? Can, you, can we work out what you could do to help you get up on time the next day uh, on time right. without late and without rushing? So what we'll do is we'll focus on being curious about how they operate rather than being judgmental about how they operate yeah. and that tool is really powerful because once they take the judgments out of the equation they'll start to function better because the interesting thing about ADHD is there's often an element of emotional dysregulation which means that essentially once your emotions kick in mm. your prefrontal cortex stops working properly I mean, you know what that's like. When we get really emotional, we just don't function yeah. very well. Yeah. People with ADHD find that emotional regulation more difficult. So as soon as their kind of judgment kicks in, they stop being able to think clearly about how yep. they can do things differently. Uh -huh. So that's the reason that a lot of the work that I do is on this bit um, as, as we're working together in right. a very practical way, um, often in clients' homes when there isn't a pandemic on. Yeah. Um, so being on the ground with them, giving them practical support, and at the same time, you know, talking about this stuff is really useful. Yeah. And which areas, you know, are there certain areas that, that they find more difficult to keep organized? Like, is it paper, you know, time management, or is it physical things like closets and kitchens and, you know? It can be the whole lot. It right. can be the whole lot or it can just be one thing. So like, I've got a client at the moment who's, um, if you went to her home, it's, it's tidier than my home. Right. Um, but what's going on in her head is much more chaotic and she's really struggling with her time management right. and task management. So that's the work that we're doing. Um, I work, so, so people with ADHD can be extremely tidy. So right. that's really important to recognize. Mm. So, and in fact, I think it's the reason why there's quite a few professional organizers who have ADHD ah, because okay. we've, learned, we've learned to be tidy. I'm not a naturally tidy person, but I've yeah. learned loads of strategies to be organized. So, um, and then we, we apply them to our clients. So, so that's one extreme and the other extreme, there's the kind of floor drobe yeah. um, scenario, which is, you know, pretty common. Um, so I worked with a client, um, I've been working with a client for the last couple of years who the first time we worked together, she told me that her goal was to be able to dance in her bedroom. Oh, wow. Okay. Such a great ADHD goal. I love yeah. it. <laughs> That's brilliant. <laughs> that when, when I worked with her, the first session, there was about um, a foot deep of stuff on the floor. So, so we worked on that area. But right. As I said to you before, it's about what they're interested in. So if you've yeah. got somebody who say works in the fashion industry, their clothes might be really organized, but their paperwork might be terrible. Yeah, yeah. Um, if you've got somebody who works in a, an accounting or law or something like that, their paperwork might be really organized, but the, their kitchen might be a complete state. Right. So there's, there's no absolutes with ADHD. It's yeah, yeah. the thing that they're least interested in will be the thing that's the most chaotic. If that wow, makes sense. who knew that this is, this is all fascinating. And I can't believe like body doubling is a term that I can use now that I'm body doubling. Yeah. My clients <laughs> all these years are doing that. That's, that's just crazy. Um, and finally, I just wanted to ask like, 
what are your, some of your, no, actually, before I ask, what are the post-it notes, the colored post-it notes behind um, you? Okay, yeah, so that's, that's quite funny. So I've used post-it notes for the last few years as a way of visualizing what needs doing, because I'm right. quite a visual person. Um, and this year, right at the beginning of lockdown, actually, I started studying about Kanban, the Kanban system. I don't know if you're, if you, have you heard of the Kanban no, system? No. It's a Japanese productivity tool. Right. And um, I started exploring that system. And it's a way of kind of focusing on the work in progress, essentially, rather than all the things you've got to do. So right. all the things you can see behind me are the things that I've got to do, but right. a bit further to the right, but I'll just turn it briefly. Yeah. You can see there's three post-it notes in the middle. That's the bit I'm interested in. And that's ah. the bit I'm, that's going to be my two tasks for today. At the top, it says doing. Right. And those are my two tasks that I'm going to start off with for today. So it's ah. a really good productivity tool actually with ADHD. Yeah. And I'm encouraging a lot of my clients to explore it because it's very simple. It's really flexible. Just made a little video about it that I can send you the link. Oh, yeah, that would be lovely. <laughs> Um, yeah. just as a sort of introduction to the concept but um yeah it's how I've got stuff done during lockdown I've, I've got a huge amount of stuff done oh wow um, okay that's amazing because yeah. I know that if I've had I did have a client who had ADHD and we worked for a few months you know on organizing her house and different things and she did give me a book about it and she said a lot of her you know she'd use an organizer in Canada when she lived there before and a lot of it had been color coded and she said that worked for her and that was a thing yeah. for a lot of people that she yeah. knew who had it um so that's why I was intrigued by the post-it notes whether it was linked to that because it's yeah your visual stimulus it, it works doesn't it with the color absolutely and yeah color so the orange notes are my home stuff and the blue notes are work stuff and right. it's all intermingled that's like a really important principle is that you don't sort of say oh work's more important than home you, everything goes in together because it's part of your life that's yeah my life can board board there oh. it's not just about not just about work it's not just about productivity it's about living life yeah essentially. well so, that's a yeah. That's fascinating because I mean, in my calendar, it is different colors so that I can see straight away yeah. what is work and what is uh, yeah. home and what is, you know, blah, blah, blah. So this is actually fascinating that I've sort of been doing it, but not realizing that doing it, this is, yeah. This and, is and I think for ADHD, if I was going to give any practical tips, it would be to use visual, to use color. Right. Um, it's really useful um, to also to um, choose small, uh, big categories. So like if you're doing filing, you know, start off with the big categories first. So sometimes people are overwhelmed. I'll say to them, let's just put your filing into three big categories, home, work, and finances. And we'll start off with that. And that feels so much less overwhelming than saying we've got to look at every single piece of paper and make a decision about every single piece of paper. Yeah, yeah. So that could be really useful. And, yeah. and I think my other really top tip um which is more of a principle really is to reduce the obstacles you know right. if you're not putting your sorting your laundry particularly efficiently what can you do to make it really really easy and sometimes people you know they're kind of slightly offended by the idea you've got to find the easiest way but if yeah. we start to recognize the fact that even having a lid on the laundry bin might mean you just pile stuff up on top of the laundry bin rather than throw it in yeah um, that that can be too much of an obstacle you know we've all come across filing cabinets with a big pile of stuff on the top um yeah. so, so any way that you can reduce obstacles um for yourself if you've got adhd is is like really helpful and sometimes it's the most important bit is the recognizing this is a really annoying thing that's bugging me yeah, yeah. and paying attention to it saying right i'm going to hyper focus on solving this problem because people with adhd are often great problem solvers you know they're great at solving other people's problems but they don't always turn the attention onto their own yeah. lives but um, i think because yeah. it's more exciting to do it for somebody else right yeah that's true yeah, yeah. About your own laundry system <laughs> yeah, yeah i know that's true i think that we even if you don't have adhd you want to like as organizers we, it, we find more joy helping other people and fixing their things rather than it's only when i come home afterwards i look at my stuff and go yeah i should do that now <laughs> yeah, exactly exactly it's motivating isn't it at that yeah point? it is it is um anyway 
This has been amazing. Thank you so much, Sarah. I just, it's been fascinating to hear how you work and what you do and how you help, you know, ADHD clients. And now I'm thinking a few of my clients, I think, have it and maybe don't know or do know and just haven't disclosed it as well. But, you know, it's always good to know what to look out for. Uh, Definitely. You know, I, I think it's it's very unusual for a professional organizer not to have worked with someone with ADHD. Yeah. When I'm, when I'm doing my training, there's always this point where somebody's like, Oh, I remember working with that client six years ago and yeah. you know, the pen drops essentially. So, yeah. Yeah. And I mean, here it's, it's, we're still, you know, you said the UK was behind the Middle East is even further behind. So it's only now getting recognized as something that has to you know help has to be given and that there has to be tools for people with ADHD here so it, it's it's always good to get it out there and to you know to show that we can help them um yeah. so yeah this is great um so I think you know with particularly for women it's massively underdiagnosed so the stereotype of ADHD is the naughty boy bouncing off walls right so that's, right that's yeah how think about it but yeah. we miss out the girl who's sitting daydreaming at her desk not really paying attention in class and not and underachieving right and so so for many people it's not picked up until their adults and their child's been diagnosed you know that's a really common uh, um, so yeah so does that but, mean that a lot of like these housewives who are not able to organize the house may have it and like you know the husbands are saying they're not good you know why, yeah. why what are you doing all day yeah. and it's yeah. maybe because yeah. they've got that and haven't had it diagnosed. A really common pattern and of course you know particularly if you're quite isolated at home you don't have the motivation of other people supporting you that you would do if you're working in an office you don't have the accountability yes so like for many women that's the point where they start struggling um, you know, because they're having to do the boring stuff, you know, essentially when you're at home with small children, a lot of day-to-day -day life is quite boring and mundane. So yeah. it's like, you know, that's the point where they really start struggling. Yeah, exactly. And I think, yeah. Um, and th they get the judgment as well. So that's not helping them to then get over that and to, to you know, to deal with that. So yeah, that's it, emotions kick in and, and, and everything just stops working so well. Yeah. Yeah. Oh my God. We've just, yeah. Housewives. Are, and that's a big thing here because a lot of them come here, you know, as expat wives and have to look after the house, look after the kids, do the school run, do this and that. And it's not what they were be doing before. So that I think there's a lot of ladies that might have that, you know, and just not been diagnosed with ADHD even it might be a bit mild but it's it, it's affecting them in the home so this is brilliant we've just this has been a eye-opener for me <laughs> you know I it's one it's something that I'm really passionate about is trying to encourage people to access diagnosis assessment and diagnosis if possible because it's so damaging to live your whole life feeling a little bit rubbish which yeah. is you know, the ADHD experience, you didn't do particularly well at school, you know, maybe you went from job to job, um, not very successfully, maybe you struggled in relationships. There's like, so many different elements that ADHD can impact. Yeah. And, and not understanding that there's a, an actual reason for this is really debilitating for people. So for women, often they get um, diagnosed with anxiety and depression right. and what they don't realize is there's ADHD underlying it all and once the ADHD right. is treated you know they suddenly the anxiety and depression lifts because they're able to get stuff done and, yeah. and function better. So. Wow okay wow this is great all right thank you so much Sarah it's been like fascinating like yeah there's no other words, fascinating and interesting. And um, I'm definitely going to use some of the tricks with my clients as well and, and pick up maybe that, you know, that they, they need to go get diagnosed. So thank you so much for that. I really do appreciate oh, it. You're so welcome. It's, and, it's like one of my favorite things to talk about. So <laughs> this is why I thought that, you know, we, we've been talking for years. So I was like, well, you, you, you need to come and talk about it. Um, and you have a, a help sheet you've given, you've sent over that we're going to share on the Declutter Me blog as well with some tips tricks right and yep. um and where can we uh you know if people want to talk to you because you do virtual online sessions as well now 
I right. do, yes. Um, since the pandemic, I've been focusing on that. Right. Um, so if people want to find out more about my work, um, I'm on www.freeyourspace.co.uk. Right. Um, so come and, come and take a look. There's lots of ADHD resources on that website as well. So do have a look, have a little explore, read some blogs um, and let me know what you think. Awesome. Thank you again so much uh, for being on. And uh, yeah, we'll, we'll hopefully get to speak to you again. All Thanks right. so much for inviting me, Shalina. No Take worries. Care. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.